Hi, welcome to why a 4 to 1 TUR is not enough, the importance of analyzing the probability of false accept. If anyone has any questions, uh, please type them in uh, at the chat, chat bar and I will answer them at the end of this session. What Morehouse does, we are a manufacturing company that produces force calibration equipment and adapters that are used in industry to measure force. We have state-of-the-art force and torque calibration laboratories and offer calibrations at a very high level of accuracy. Our purpose, why we exist, we create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. That's why we're giving this webinar, that's what we're passionate about. We want you to, we want to help you make better measurements. My name is Henry Zumbrun, I've been with Morehouse for 20 years, president of Morehouse for the last five years. If you need, have any additional questions or need to contact me, the web address is mhforce.com and the email is hzumbrun at mhforce. So this crazy guy about 25 years ago used to approach the acceptance limits of how much beer his body could handle, uh, wrote a paper and now is having a webinar on why 4 to 1 TUR is not enough, the importance of analyzing the probability of false accept. We all, we've all heard this term PFA uh, and that's the probability of false accept and we're going to examine why that's in, important and we're going to start with, you know, why write this paper? You know, several organizations and publications reference or insist on maintaining a four to one test uncertainty ratio, TUR, without understanding the level of risk that they may be subjecting themselves to. The general thought is that as long as a lab performing the calibration has standards at least four times better than what they are calibrating, that everything is good. Is it? Well, it's not. Uh, and this came back from, you know, this is back to the 1950s that this came, came about. Um, Lots of different people, lots of different things, different ways of calculating it. Uh, we're talking about T T U R now, but T T A R was big. You know, like, hey, if I as long as something's four times more accurate, I'm okay. That was the general thought, but it's not. You know, and back in the 50s, uh, people, uh, Alan Eagle and some other people, they wrote papers, they did things, they knew this, uh, they knew the problems, they were pretty smart. But so. ANSI Z540.3 uh, was a standard that came out, and uh, that came out in 2006, and it changed things a little bit for, for everybody, even those people had previously written these papers and everything else, but it changed things as far as the requirements for calibrate, calibration and measuring of test equipment in Section 5.3b allows for use of a test uncertainty ratio to or equal to or greater than 4 to 1 when it is not practical to estimate the false accept risk of less than 2%. Then goes to say objective evidence of non-practicality of this determinate is expected in agreement with the customer TUR use. Look, this is a fallback position that a lot of industry has adopted, maybe because they did not understand or want to deal with guard bands. The assumption is that the higher the TUR, the higher the probability the measuring equipment will have a PFA of less than 2%. Like I said, uh, date-wise, 2006, back to 1952, you know, we're, we're dealing with over 50 years of this stuff that people are not having great agreement or what to do. So let's examine these four bullet points and see what conclusions we can make about TURs and if 4 to 1 is not good enough. And we'll talk about test uncertainty ratio, why having just a 4 to 1 TUR is not enough, probability of false accept, and we'll talk about guard banding. So if anyone has questions, again, just type them in, we'll answer them. So. We look at uh, the current ISO standard, well the current one's 2017, but we look at the one that several people are still using, this was adopted in 2005, so theoretically everybody should be paying attention um, to statements of compliance and they should have been for the last you know, 14 or so years. I don't know why they haven't been. I don't know why that now that's a big topic, but it is. Uh, we talk to a lot of people and it's how do we do uncertainties? How do we make these? How do we do decision rules? So ISO uh, 2005, 51042 says state when statements of compliance are made, the uncertainty of the measurement shall be taken into account. So then 2017 comes out, 78.6.1, when a statement of conformity to a specification or standard for test or calibration is provided, the laboratory shall document the decision rule employed, taking into account the level of risk, such as false accept and false reject, and statistical assumptions associated with the decision rule employed, and apply the decision rule. So, let's look at this. Um, here we have 
here we have a statement of conformity. What's this mean? Uh, this comes directly from ILAC G8. It basically says we have two scenarios. There's, the result is reported as conforming with the spe specification, pretty simple, AB. Uh, the result is reported as not conforming with the specification. Well, let's look at A. In, in the scenario of A, I, these are, I have my nominal value and an upper limit. All of A and the uncertainty, there's the location of A right here, this the little blue dot, and then the, 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 the bands are the uncertainty. Everything is in. There's, there's zero risk in this, uh, as long as people are following the right procedures, using the right adapters and everything else. But if we're just paying attention here, location of the measurement, everything's good. Now in the B scenario, a lot of people are gonna say this is good. Hey, we're in tolerance, but about a third, when you look at the uncertainty, maybe the lab that's doing the calibration, maybe the resolution's high, I don't know. When you look at all of this, it's more than likely it's the lab that's doing the calibration. They have a higher uncertainty, and therefore, when they make this measurement, a third of it's out. So there's, we call that, you say that's 33%. Whatever's out is risk, and we say that's risk. So when we look at this, um, we start, oftentimes people say, hey, let's, let's, in, let's look at TUR, uh, let's look at location of the measurement, and then let's calculate risk. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So let's first, let's look at the TUR. TUR is test uncertainty ratios. This is directly out of uh, NCSLI uh, and CC540.3. The ratio of span of tolerance of measurement quantity subject to calibration to twice the 95% expanded uncertainty of the measurement process no used for calibration. Look, right here, aside to what's this mean? Here's, here's your, there, simple, simple to calculate, right? Well, I show you the next slide, yeah. But you see it other ways, tolerance divided by expanded uncertainty, then you see this one, upper specification limit minus lower specification times four times the standard uncertainty, CPU, calibration process uncertainty here, two times the expanded uncertainty, that's per ILAC P14. Here's, here's your general equation for expanded uncertainty, two times the CMC uh, plus the resolution of the UUT and the repeatability of the UUT. And then you have this formula, and this is what we use a lot of. And when we say UUT tolerance up here, I want I want everyone to know this is one-sided. If it's two, if it was a two-sided tolerance, then it would be the bottom would be the, the two times two times the expanded. But if we're just looking at one-sided, we can use this formula, which means hey, I have a device that's a thousand pounds. I want it to be plus or minus ten. We're just using the ten. If we were to use 20, you divide that by two, it's 10 anyway. So this, this simplifies it a bit on the one-sided. Um, and it's, but it, this is for when tolerance is symmetric and we're using, yeah, and dividing by the expanded uncertainty. So it needs to be symmetric for that, that one really to work. But, so let's look at this. So we take Morehouse versus a typical calibration lab. We're using dead weights. You can see the dead weights on the left. Dead weights, uh, CMC of, of better than 0.02% of applied. This customer sends us a 10,000 pound device. They want 0.05% of full scale and they have a resolution of 0.01 pounds. Resolution of 0.01 pounds, that's, that's, that's a pretty significant, you know, that's a, it's pretty significant amount of counts. That's a million counts. So, but they have it. And uh, 0.05 per pound repeatability. We determine all of this. So we do this, we do a calculation, we say, what is our TUR, what's our expanded uncertainty, what's the TUR, one side of tolerance of five pounds. Our TUR here is 22 to one. So a competitor does it, or you know, one of these automated force machines does it, they typically achieve 0.5, um, accurate to 0.5 of applied. Uh, some, some people claim better, but it, when you, factor in everything else, so typically 0.5, uh, maybe 0.4, uh, a full scale with a 0.01 pound resolu resolution is the same and a 0.1 pound repeatability. Well, why is that different than over here? It's basically because this machine is produces things that are a little more unknown. You may not be able to hit the exact force point, may not be able to control it. As with dead weight, it's just a static load. So in scenario, in the other lab, if you're using a hydraulic machine or, or even you know some of some of our machines, the repeatability is not going to be as good as if you're using dead weight. So, just wanted to make that side note. So, if we look at everything for them, the TUR is one to one. 
And then I have to ask, do you think a one-to-one -one TUR will meet ISO IEC 17025 2017 section 645, which states the equipment used for measurement shall be capable of achieving measurement accuracy and or measurement uncertainty required to provide a valid result? Is it? Are you going to be okay with a one-to-one -one TUR? Well, it depends. It really does depend. But Morehouse does the calibration. You can see here, look at Look at all this room. We're dead center. 10,000 pounds measured value. 10,000 pounds is applied. 10,000 pounds. We're saying desired level of risk in this equation. This 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 sheet will also give us our guard bands, which are these green lines, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about these later. But this is basically saying, hey, Morehouse does the cow. As long as that instrument reads between 10,000 and 4.77 and 9,995.22. We can make this, we can say that's either in compliance or conformance, depending on what standard you're using to. Hey, the other lab does the cow. Guess what? 10,000 pounds, they have the one-to-one. -one. Total risk down here, 4.55%. This is saying, hey, you have to read 9998646, uh, 1000.1354. You're not going to be basically you're not going to be in tolerance if you use method 5 it's it's showing right here you're going to have more than more than 2% risk on either side which is down here 2.27 so risk level 2% that's what it's saying um here you have if you use method 6 you may be able to pass it but we'll talk about that um so tr morehouse versus typical force lab why is this happening Basically, the uncertainty. Look, standard uncertainty here is 0.11. Standard uncertainty here is 2.5. That's going to make the width of this curve larger, and that's going to give risk on each side of that 2.28%. So basically, their uncertainty of the standards in this scenario are not good enough to really provide that calibration or the resolution of the device, which isn't the case here because the resolution was a million counts, but it is something to watch for or the repeatability of the device. And but in this in this scenario the whole way through, that lab, if you need that quality, uh, if you need that O5, you're not going to be able to go to the lab with the with the O5 that has the same, that gives you a one-to-one -one TUR in this particular scenario. So what do what are we saying about all this? And we're basically saying we're looking at a large versus a small expanded uncertainty. This is right from G8, and a small relative expanded uncertainty, again, using dead weights will give us a wider interval to be intolerant. So any measurement we make within the gray is going to be intolerance. We can pass instruments. You know, a device could be 10,004. We can pass it. You're not going to have an out-of-tolerance out condition. Whereas if you have a small, um, you know, small relative uncertainty uh, versus the large, if you have a large relative expanded uncertainty, down here below is a large, you have less room less acceptance interval. So in this scenario, there's less room to be intolerance. If you send your equipment to this lab and they say, hey, it's intolerance, that's great. That means the location of the measurement is going to be very, very close to center. But what, what if it's drifted a little bit? What if it's gone out? What if, what if something's happened? More, more often than not, they're going to say, hey, your device is out of tolerance. The probability of false accept is 10% or more. And that's really the decision rule applied back to the standard. It's really saying they need to do that. So what, what I think you're going to see happening more and more as people implement the standard is more people are going to get out of tolerance conditions because they're going to, they're going to use the proper equations and they're going to analyze the level of risk. And when that risk level, when, when a customer submits something or to you and they say hey I want the decision rule employed and I want that PFA reported it's going to be higher than 2% in the cases where those labs have the large relative expanded uncertainty most of the time because they have a much much smaller acceptance interval if we look at this graphically Morehouse usually provides a larger we we have more room to say your device the device is intolerance look at it versus a you know that typical force lab not much room um, versus we give a lot of room. In this example, the unit read 10,000 pounds. Uh, you know, what do you think happens when we move the location of the measurement? So we move the location of this measurement here. You can see 
you can see this, the risk level. Uh, the measure value has changed to 10,004. Some people are still going to say, hey, my, my the tolerance is plus or minus five pounds. I'm still in tolerance. Yeah. Well, if it reads 10,004, when Morehouse calibrates it, it is still in tolerance. When the lab with uncertainty parameter of on their CMC of 05 calibrates it, the risk goes from 4.55 to 34.47. So the question is, is anybody that's making measurements okay with 34.47 in this scenario? And if you're still having a little bit of problems following, following this, I liken this to a parking lot scenario with a car door. The lab with the smaller, you know, the lab with the small uncertainties is going to allow you to open your door, get out of the car, not worry about anything. You can have a freaking picnic in there most of the time, a lot less out of tolerance conditions. The lab that, that when the TURs are smaller and the lab with those larger uncertainties is the situation where someone's pulled up and you're both on the parking lot and you got to get out of the car, suck in your gut, get all your clothes dirty because you're shimmying across just because you can barely, barely get out of the spot. And if they pulled up any closer, you wouldn't be able to get out of your car. So that's what that's essentially what's happening. And when we look at PFA, um, we were looking at that. All measurements have a per, have a percentage of a likelihood of calling something good when it is bad and something bad when it is good. You might be familiar with the terms consumer's risk and producer's risk. The probability of false accept is similar to consumer's risk. Uh, it's likely of calling a measurement good or stating something is intolerant when, when there is a percentage that the measurement is bad or out of tolerance. So consumer's risk really it's a refers to a possibility of a problem occurring in a consumer oriented product. Occasionally a product not meeting quality standards passes undetected through manufacturer's quality control system and enters the consumer market. When you see a lot of recalls, you know, we have the Samsung Note 7 phone, we have strollers being recalled, we have cars, brakes. When you see a lot of these recalls, they are consumers risk. They are things you never ever want to happen. Uh, you have tremendous, these companies have tremendous liabilities. They often get sued and it costs them a fortune. Same thing in metrology. You know, when you have that risk level, you know, when that, those lines are outside, you know, that 30 some percent is outside of that band, that's, that's a risk um, to you. So that's a risk that's, that not going, that device is not going to, make a good measurement or there's 34.47 percent that it's going to make a measurement with a higher uncertainty than what you think it's capable of on the producer side this is the lab side we have, we're up the street from a cookie company on a producer side hey you know i'm making a bag of 16 ounce cookies and i get fined if those 16 ounce cookies are, are underweight so i'm going to give you guys i can't control my process as well so i'm going to give you guys 16.1 or 16.2 ounces of cookies so i never get fined that costs me money and that's what's happening is when we when we do guard bands and different strategies the ones that are more aggressive give higher consumers risk the ones that are less aggressive um, may give can have a tendency to give uh, a little bit on producer, on uh, consumers. It, it just depends. Uh, the importance here, most people are using method five or method six. This discussion is centered around uh, false accepts and some other things. So just to some, depends what you need to do. We have an, a, a spreadsheet that you can email and we're happy to hand it out if you wanna compare method five, method six, and do, do some other testing. So ANSI, NCSLI, um, Z540 false accept. So ANSI, ANSI subclause 5.3 is the tolerance type test requirement that the probability that an incorrect acceptance decision false accept will result from calibre shall not exceed 2%. There's where we're getting all this 2% from. It's from this. With a preponderance of calibrations being of this type, the resource and conditions described by the calibration procedure will require careful evaluation and determination to achieve the measurement uncertainty needed for the calibration process to achieve this allowable probability of false accept. Okay. I like what NASA says. This is this is nice. It's good, but I like what NASA says a lot better. False accepts. Why is this important? The why. Why do we do this? False accepts can result in reduced end of function or capacity, mission loss or compromise, loss of life, damage corporate reputation, warranty expenses, shipping and associated costs for return items, loss of future sales, punitive damages, legal fees, all this. You can go to NASA publication and references. In this business, a false accept can be a reason a rocket blows up. A false accept on a critical component may be a reason, uh, may result in loss of life. 
you're not following a lot of that. We, you know, we can't bring people back, but we can be smarter about our measurements. And if, and if you're responsible for doing something stupid because of your measurements, shame on you. And someone dies for it, shame on you. So when we look at that and we look at why is this important, we look at the PFA of 2%, that's the managed risk level. The entire purpose of analyzed PFA is to ensure your measurements are in tolerance with a risk that does not exceed 2%. That's what they that's what C540 agreed on. And why just knowing you have a 4 to 1 TR without analyzing the PFA regarding the location of the measurement is not enough. And it's not. So 4 to 1 doesn't tell me anything. It, it just tells me that, hey, that company is going to use the device as four times more accurate. I'm going to have um, the smaller, I'm going to, I'm going to have the smaller, smaller uncertainty. Therefore, there's more room for me to be in. There's less chance of hitting the car door but it still can happen if we do not pay attention to the location of the measurement. And that's why we care about the location if the device is intolerance. If the device has a specification of 0.1% of full scale and the calibration laboratory reports a value within 0.1%, the device is intolerance, right? Lots of people still think it is. The answer in is always will be, it depends on the uncertainty of the measurement and what the location of that measurement is. So in this business, like I said, there's false accept, there's an example of it, rocket blows up, happens. So could be one where someone didn't pay attention to the location of the measurement, could be another reason. Could be human error, could be lots of different things. So just start thinking about that. So in this example, the TUR is almost 20 to one, yet the risk is 5.6. Again, four to one, 20 to one, when we, when we actually look, Measured value, 1,009.6, 10,000 pound load cell with a 0.1 pound resolution, very believable. In this scenario, if we measure that, people, some people are going to say this is intolerance. It's not. Standard is certainly 0.25. People may think it's intolerance, but it's intolerance with a risk of 5.6%, so it does not meet that 2%. So this is a specific situation that actually happens. So help me out. Is 5.6 greater than 2%? I ask, as I've seen contracts written, where the requirement is 0.02% of applied force, and the company that wins the contract can only achieve 0.05%. What does that look like? Does that work? Well, here's what that looks like. Tolerance requirement of 0.02. Calibration lab can only do 0.05. Location of the measurement, perfect. In this case, 43 42.37% risk, all this, all this that hangs outside of the curve, that's all, all of it right here, all risk. So is that okay? You know, that's the reason that's, and it'd be part of the reason these things happen. You know, failures to be inevitable in the wake of, look, failures appear to be inevitable in the wake of prolonged success, which encourages lower margins of safety. Uh, companies get complacent sometimes, and when things are good, they worry less and may not make the right preventative actions. Remember the BP uh, refinery that blew up? Trace back to calibration. There are lots of things. There's uh, Cox Lab Health. They overdose cancer patient. Trace back to calib. That was procedural based. But uh, Stealth Bomber. Trace back to calibrate NASA. Uh, the Hubble. The Hubble telescope. They didn't want to pay to get the mirror calibrated. The million dollars to get the mirror calibrated cost a billion dollars. All this stuff, uh, it matters, and it matters a lot. And, you know, there was a Skyway that collapsed uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, engineers didn't do the right thing. You know, some of this stuff is human fault. Some of it's not getting stuff. Recent crane in Seattle, I guess that was a, a procedure one. But some are related directly to the instruments and using the wrong equipment to accomplish it. And this is why the risk matters. If we're trying to balance a hydro turbine, you know, and we're using load cells or that aren't capable of giving us our, our measurements, and, you know, we're not going to detect if we need to take take stuff out for that to spin properly. A windmill, all, all, all kinds of different different products uh, need these measurements to be very, very accurate. A satellite, you send a satellite into space and you don't measure it properly, it's gonna wobble. A uh, wobbly sab satellite's no good to several people. So that's it's problematic and can cost a lot of money. This situation uh, arose in a lot of deaths and it was stupid, didn't need to happen. So on to 
when TUR does not matter. A 4 to 1, 20 to 1, 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1, million to 1 does not mean anything to anyone if the instrument is right on the tolerance limit. If you look at this example, TUR is 31.22 to 1. We are right on the tolerance line, and our risk is always going to be 50%. If we look at what our allowable limit is, yes, it's very, 900, if, if the instrument would read 9995.16, we would be good. If it would read 10,004.83559, we'd still be within the 2%. As soon as we go right to 10,005, the measured value, right on that tolerance line, we're going to have 50% or more risk all of the time. So why use guard bands? Uh, in, instead, you know, why are we doing this? Why, why, you know, let's, why are we reducing by the measurement uncertainty? Um, instead of saying, hey, the standard must be at least 10 times as accurate as the gauge being calibrated. A four to one TAR must be maintained or a four to one TUR is required. You know, we, we use these because these statements do not take into account the location of the measurements. They don't. So if we start using guard band, the measurement uncertainty is going to allow for the proper acceptance limit to be set with the appropriate amount of risk. Anything in gray uh, would be an acceptable location. You want to use a lab with a small expanded uncertainty, more, there's going to be a lot more chance that they're going to say your device is intolerant. You use a lab with a small relative or a large relative expanded uncertainty, uh, there's going to be a lot less chance that they're going to say, hey, this device is okay. And then you're going to have to deal with recalls. You're going to have to deal with out of tolerance. You're going to have to do calculations and determine if the measurements you made re need to be, re equipment needs to be recalled. So it's really, really costly if you get a scenario where someone says, hey, I need this device to conform to this, this specification, and the Cal Lab says it does not. You're left with, what do you do? Let's understand this a little bit more. We're going to talk just a brief about uncertainty. Starts with SI units. Force, torque, uh, composed of SI units of mass, length, and time. We we go, we, we're using primary standards. That, the National uh, Metrology Institute here, NIST, they, they're running a, of about four parts per million standard uncertainty. Morehouse, our big dead weight machine, was calibrated. All the weights were done by NIST. We're about eight. Uh, we, we, we follow A2LA's recommendation, R205, to have the five R's and the E, and we're, we run around 0 .008 when we do our full uncertainty. And then you get down to the credited Cal suppliers, and they run around 02. All these get multiplied by two when we're looking at, looking at everything. Working lab, field measurements. And then it, the important thing is the further you get away from this, the larger the uncertainty becomes. So that larger uncertainty is going to give you you know, that less chance of calling a device intolerance. And uncertainty of, you know, what is that? It's a value, best definition I've heard, value assigned to doubt. You know, people say I'm uncertain. What is uncertain? It's doubt. Doubt the validity of the measurement. So value assigned to doubt about the validity of the assigned calibration value. Documented measurement uncertainties are required on calibration certificate to support metrological traceability. That's, the exception is when the customer agrees to not having the measurement uncertainty reported. But if the customer agrees to that, they cannot use that device to further disseminate any measurements. They can basically say, go, no go. So guard banding. Uh, it's one tech, it's what we're talking about. Uh, how do we determine this? How do we do it? It's one technique to protect against uh, conformity decisions caused by measurement uncertainty where the region of permissible values of the entity's quality characteristics is reduced in proportion to the actual measurement uncertainty. As used as a national standard, a guard band is used to change the criteria for making measurement decisions such as pass or fail. For, from some tolerances or specification limits to achieve a defined objective, such as 2% probability of false accept, the offset may be either be added to or subtracted from the decision value to achieve the objective. All those graphs show this. But what's interesting about guard banding is where it came about. Um, it appears to have its origins in the early radio days when the band of frequencies expected to be utilized by two radio channels or stations were separated by a band of frequency that served to guard against mutual interference by the two channels. So I'm driving down the highway and I like, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Led Zeppelin. You know, I don't have a guard band and maybe this, you know, maybe maybe country comes on and Conway Twitty's uh, playing. Nothing against Conway Twitty, I actually like him, but that's a hybrid 
mix of eclectic music if if things are bleeding into one another all of a sudden you know the my led zeppelin song goes into country and black force so they, they separated those frequencies and it gave them a buffer basically to say hey you're going to tune into 98.5 and you're going to be you're not going to hear the country station on you know what 98.8 so that's all it is same thing with metrology but here what it's doing here it's a guard band is how close we can park the line if we're in a car and still be able to get out of the car we might have to shimmy out if we're this close to the line uh in the guard band over here this guard band and that guard we might have to shimmy out of the car depends on the location of the measurement and depends on the uncertainty in this case 31.22 we have lots of room lots of room to still be able to get out of our car and in this scenario so method five method five guard bands that's what we're showing that's what we're using we're there's a simplest to calculate they're calculated only from the measurement and certainly the test limit is based on the worst case pfa that will be accepted for any individual measurement recommended recommended per ILAC g8 the current version not the not the new one that's in draft and coming out soon and Remember when we talked about can you know uh, producers risk high probability of false accept because they may be too aggressive that's producers risk so there there may be situations where we're saying hey we're being a little overly aggressive when the people who wrote the standard uh, did this they used 95.45 percent uh, as the confidence level which most has a coverage factor of two. So it's important to know that if you're doing 2%, uh, the risk when they wrote this standard, they call it 2% and they round it down, but the risk is actually 2.275. And this is just a, an example if you if you go by them and it shows it's 2.27. So important to report guard band with, uh, guard band with uh, the 2.5 risk, 9995, guard band with 2%, 2% gives you a little less room uh, when you when you when you understand it fully but at 95% or two and a half our limits would become and you can calculate these all of this can be calculated uh, just important use maybe useless information maybe some interesting if you start doing the math and, and don't have it work out for you and, and that's why so it will work on on these scenarios the sheets that we have available for download will work so it says measured value here nine 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 six point 029 we go back to that at 2.6 at 2% 2 risk 996.029 so these both agree and draw the graph what's the risk 2% so formula works here's a example we document the rule here we're reporting the expanded uncertainty we're reporting uh, the measured value P14 measured value plus you know y plus or minus u reporting all that we're also reporting the TUR here and a PFA and a compliance so it's pass specified tolerance um, there's a decision rule all of these instruments you can see what they read acceptance limit upper lower where where the measurement is where the location is what the risk is see look it's zero when the measurement is perfect location and then as it creeps you know just a little bit 50 counts up it becomes 0.063 if that creeped up a little bit more it would be out of tolerance so something to look at putting it in more perspective here's here's a piece of equipment we sell it's a portable calibrating machine it does 2,000 pounds it calibrates you know analog force gauges handheld force gauge load cells everything else but if we look at it uh, typically expanded on you know we look at their CMC expanded uncertainty parameter the calibration measurement capability parameter on the scope expanded uncertainty uh, what what a lab is capable of it this is generally 0.2% of applied some people claim 0.25 some people claim 0.3 depending how many load cells how many standards you have you can achieve 0.2 with this machine it may require you to purchase three 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 load cell standards this this thing on the bottom but can we calibrate this different equipment so look at the force gauge yeah pretty much we have lots of room on each side the specifications high but we can all the instrument needs to read between 995.4 and 1004.6 you know again people think plus or minus five i'm in right no this force gauge it needs to be 995.4 to have less than the two percent risk here you can see where we are measured value and you can see the total risk is 0.03 if we move just a little bit more we're going to be past we're going to be past that uh that two percent so here uh 500 pound digital 0.1 percent 
some people think on this I have plus or minus half a pound. Eh, if you want to make a statement of um, conformance, um, statement of compliance, no, you do not. Uh, and you want to do it with less than 2% risk, no. You have plus or minus 0.3 pounds, 4997 to 500.3. In, in this case scenario, TUR 4.33, you have, as long as you're within those bands, you're good. Here's a situation where we're looking at both method five and method six in this situation. I want to do another load cell. I want to do a load cell with a tolerance of 0.025. Well, our TUR is approaching one to one, but it's one to five here. We can do it. If we're using method five, we have very, very tight acceptance limits, you know, plus or minus 0.1 pound at 2000. If we're using method six, and the sheet does this as well, if we're using method six, we have a little bit more, eh, about 0.33. So it gives us a little more room. You know, it's, uh, it's definitely not as conservative as method five, but it's also acceptable practice to use method six to get a little more room to, to be in. And, and this graph shows it. You can see the specification, the different methods. So conclusion, uh, the decision rule applied should eliminate the assumption that a four to one or better TUR uh, allows a claim of compliance deemed to meet the 2% PFA requirement. The TUR only shows a ratio, and if that ratio is too large, a laboratory may not be able to make a statement of compliance or conformance with either uh, ISO IEC 17025 standard. PFA is all about location, 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 just like real estate. Uh, four to one or better TUR is not enough, and uh, I stress the importance of analyzing that location of the measurement uh, to making sure the measured value falls within the acceptance limits calculated by the accepted guard band method used. And something you may want to consider if you're a lab, this is where we're going to. We will say the device passes Cal if it's within this guard banded. We will say there's a conditional accept. It's up to the end user to determine if the risk is too large if it's in this range. And then a conditional reject, which is kind of the same thing. There's, you know, there's still some room there. The risk might seems a little high but it might be might be uh might not be good and then if it if it's beyond the uh tolerance plus the uncertainty of the measurement we fail and that's just it so this area right here the customer or you have to make the determination is the risk greater than i can live with and if so i may need to adjust it i may need to get better equipment i may need i may need to change depending on who your cal provider is, I may need to change my cal provider because they're not giving me, they're giving me out of tolerance all the time. So if you want to lower both, you use the right calibration provider and have them replicate how the device is being used. That's very important. Uh, we, we take pride in what we do, our contract review, our working with people to help them make better measurements as our purpose statement. I mean, we, we help you make better measurements. Um, we do this through lower, you know, lower uncertainties, uh, which lower, lower your risk on most things. Thing we, you know, we educate people. Uh, we, you know, you send your technicians to training. We, you know, may not make them competent, but it certainly helps. It continuous improvement, all of that. Use the right equipment. Uh, this includes adapters. Very, very important. If you're doing everything else right, but you're using the wrong adapter, your risk is going to be so high. If you want a 0.1% uh, tolerance and you're using a different different hardness of top adapter, some load cells, that will be 0.3%. So 0.3 is much higher than 0.1. So make sure you use the right adapters. We have a great paper on adapters. I encourage everybody to read it. And then lower your risk by using a calibration provider with um, lower uncertainties. Again, right calibration provider, lower uncertainties, asks the right questions, talks to you, helps you, meets your needs. It's about you. It's about having the right equipment to meet your meet measurement needs, being able to do the right calibration so you can say the devices, your devices are intolerance, your devices pass, your devices can be used to further disseminate the unit, unit of force so bridges don't collapse, so satellites don't blow up, so bad things don't happen to people because they are preventable if you make the right measurements. Human error will always happen, but the measurement part we can control and we can also help control the human error by more education and training and everything else but we know some people just do dumb things with that i thank everybody for their time i will remind people that we have a pfa sheet and a paper that is available 
for download. Please, if you have any questions, please feel free to email, uh, contact us. We're here to help. Thank you again. Your time is valuable. I will now take questions.